SJC 12662, UBS Financial Services, Inc. v. Donna M. Alaberde, and another. Good morning, Justices. Can you wait one second, oh. sir? Okay, Mr. Federelli, we're all yours. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Good morning again to all. Um, my name is Carmen Frateroli. I represent Donna Aliberti, the IRA beneficiary in this case. Um, it seems like the only thing that uh, my colleague and I uh, may agree on is that Massachusetts law should govern what we do here today and afterward. Uh, I respectfully suggest that that's accurate and that Massachusetts law, uh, as determined by this court, should be to protect IRA beneficiaries in the situation that we find ourselves in today. Now, is, is there a second area of agreement, which is that your client is a, uh, uh, as a matter of contract, is a third party beneficiary to the agreement between uh, the, the account holder and UBS? Well, there's no doubt that she is the intended beneficiary of this commercial contract. I think even UBS would agree that, um, that she is. And it, it's like... Uh, she has not been paid. Pardon? Has she, has she been paid? She has been paid. Well, that's part of the case, Judge Justice. Um, there were three accounts, two smaller accounts, yeah. one larger account. After a year and a half of battle, she was paid on the larger account, um, about 300000 uh, but late, as far as we're concerned. Even after the dispute, the alleged dispute, and we allege that there really wasn't a big dispute, but even after the dispute was resolved, UBS still waited three months to give her the money. As far as the two smaller accounts, as the record will reflect, and I think there's not much dispute about the facts, the account holder, um, Mr. Kenny requested some change forms, and they were sent to him prior to his death. He filled out the two forms having to do with the two smaller accounts incorrectly. Even they, meaning the UBS's people, rejected it. And my client claimed that she was entitled to the whole amount of those two smaller accounts. Nonetheless, as to the larger account, nothing was filled out. Exactly. She was, uh, there was, uh, was it a Mr. Gillespie who orally challenged? <clears throat> no, it wasn't oral, uh, Mr. Justice. It was a written letter about two, three weeks after the death by a, an attorney saying, I represent Mr. Gillespie, and we think we have a claim to that account, and don't do anything. Uh, my understanding is that a form letter was sent to Mr. Delaney and said, we'll get back to you, and nothing ever happened. I also understand. What, what were they supposed to do if there was somebody, if there was a dispute about the money? Well, reach out. They never responded after that. They didn't do anything, and that's part of the problem that I think permeates this entire case, uh, Justice. And that is that UBS did little, if anything, when asked to do so. I'm I'm suggesting that the fiduciary duty here requires two things. Number one, respond for information. Give the beneficiaries what they've asked for. They did not. Despite two little form letters from the dispute resolution group or whatever, they never got back to her. They never got back to the estate lawyer who wrote a letter. They never got back to me. It wasn't until they, 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 they needed to communicate, is really what you're saying. That. Without a doubt, communicate. And the second part of the fiduciary duty that I believe that they have is to promptly distribute money can, can you, can when you, there's no dispute. Can you clarify for me, please? Um, fiduciary duty to who? to the beneficiaries, that's why we're here. I, 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 you know, this is a billion dollar industry and in the marketplace here, UBS is making a lot of money off the people in this room and the people like Pat Kenny who invest their money with the UBS's and the Wells Fargo's and the Fidelities of the world and that's fine. And they may be a, a, a custodial non-discretionary account but that doesn't mean they can walk away. That doesn't mean they have no obligation to the beneficiaries of the world, to the spouses and the children who count on UBS to do the right thing when dad dies or mom dies. Can That's I ask what you a didn't question happen about here. the... Um, I'm sorry. I, no, I just want to ask about the appeals court decision. Yes. Do you agree that um, 
the question centers around the, the uh, Internal Revenue Code's definition of uh, fiduciary and uh, section, what is it, 407? I do not, Madam Justice. The, the USC, 26 USC, says for purposes of this section, an IRA, a custodial IRA, is a trust. Now, we've all seen the materials that all over the country, uh, the courts have uh, differed on what that means. Half of them say, oh, that's only in context of taxes in order for the IRA to qualify as a tax-exempt situation. The other cases all say that, yes, it says it's a trust. And if there's a trust, that means there's a beneficiary. I say to you, and I was prepared to, to advise this court, that it really doesn't matter what that code says. It's up to this court and this court to lead the way and make a decision for the benefit of all the beneficiaries like that. You can decide, as some courts have, that um, because the IRS says it's a trust, that you feel it's a trust and therefore go in that direction. Or you could say, no, we don't agree. It's only for tax purposes. Either way, I suggest to you that whether or not there is a fiduciary duty depends upon at least three of those factors that the appeals court referenced, if you will. Um, uh, if, if I may, um, reliance, control, and dominance. I mean, those are pretty important factors here, establishing a fiduciary duty. Let me ask you this, if I could. I'm sorry. Go ahead. If I could, please. So uh, you've obviously uh, uh, read and thought about the uh, Attorney General's amicus letter. I have. Um, so if you're wrong about fiduciary duty, um, is there still a 93A claim? Absolutely. I mean, the, the 93A claim is so separate uh, from the fiduciary duty. As the AG has, has said, and as I, I think I've argued as well, uh, the establishment of whether or not there's trade or commerce doesn't necessarily depend on whether there's a fiduciary duty. We're talking about a, a billion dollar marketplace where people put their money in, uh, in the hopes that the UBSs of the world will take care of them and take care of their family. So yes, there's no question in my mind that there is trade or commerce here. UBS would have you believe that, oh, well, we don't even know who Donna Alberti was. We didn't meet her. We, don't, we never saw her. She's nothing. When, we, when, when the gentleman dies, we don't have to talk to her. Well, that's wrong. It should be wrong, and I'm asking this court to make it wrong. So the answer to your question, Mr. Justice, is that there is no uh, reliance upon fiduciary duty in order to find 93A, or the, the availability of 93A to my client. If your client is a third-party beneficiary in contract and therefore has rights in contract, what is the practical consequence of us saying that there's a fiduciary duty to your client? Well, I think it raises the level of obligation higher to the UBSs of the world, the UBS in this case anyway. It's not just the contract. Well, you say, oh, no. you say that the fiduciary duty, which, is, which you describe it with a relatively low bar, they must respond to requests for information and they must properly distribute the money. If they fail to do that, would that not be arguably a breach of the <coughs> obligation under contract as a third party beneficiary and potentially could rise to a breach of the covenant of good faith and fair dealing, which would render it a 93A violation? Yes, uh, Mr. Chief Justice, um, it could. As we know, the contract claim was not appealed in this case. The appeals court reversed the superior court as to three matters, the contract claim, breach of fiduciary <coughs> duty, and 93A. UBS chose to file their FAR only on two of those three. The contract claim they realize, and I, I'd like to think we all realize, is still a viable claim. If this court rules against me on both the fiduciary duty and the 93A, I still go back to Superior Court and do my discovery and try the contract claim. So without a doubt, the contract claim is still viable, yes. Okay, but, but the question, more precisely, I guess, was what is the difference between having a fiduciary duty in practice versus having an obligation under contract to a third party beneficiary? What, what would that mean pragmatically to a bank if it had a fiduciary duty as opposed to a third party beneficiary obligation? 
Well, like with all trustees uh, in the context of a fiduciary duty, whether it's a president of a corporation to shareholders or a trustee to a beneficiary, there is a heightened requirement of uh, attention and obligation. It's not just, did I break the contract, did I not? Okay, what are the damages? Which, you know, we may still find here. It is more than that. And therefore, if there is a fiduciary duty, I think what it will mean, I hope to answer your question the second time around, is that it is a higher uh, obligation and therefore a lower bar for the plaintiff to show that there's been a breach of the duty. Now, this... This IRA, I gather, was a non-discretionary IRA. It was the, 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 the bank was not involved deciding how to invest it. Is that, is that, clear, for, that, is that clear from the record? Yeah, that's my understanding. To be honest with you, I haven't read the, the 100 pages of the client the agreement, but uh, I believe that this was a, a custodial as opposed to a trustee IRA. And uh, in my mind, I don't think it matters in terms of establishing a fiduciary duty, but yes, it was non-discretionary. But the real problem isn't while the gentleman was alive. The real problem in these cases, and it could be before, but the real problem in these cases, and I ask this court to consider, is what happens when the account holder passes? That account holder for years and years and years, having invested hundreds of thousands of dollars with UBS, has an expectation. We all have an expectation that they're going to do the right thing. Is there any reason why um, a negligence claim wasn't brought? Well, it didn't seem early on that it was a tort-based negligence type of problem. Uh, I always felt that it was a duty problem and a contract problem and a 93A problem. I suppose that's just my uh, review of the case. When it came to me, um, uh, I found other things, which the appeals court didn't uh, agree with in terms of the intentional infliction of emotional distress. And by the way, I see those things, the way that she was treated and the names that she was called as part of the potential of 93A unfair treatment. It's not just the eight things that I listed on page eight, 38 of my brief, all the eight acts or I omissions. Know, uh, by a sister-in-law, somebody, a relative, that was uh, really quite nasty? The sister-in-law, who was the account manager... At UBS. At UBS, was previously married to um, the account holder. Uh-huh, okay. And, and she was the one didn't like who other, didn't though. like Donna, Yeah, obviously. And married read to the anything. holder or the sister-in-law? I thought she was the sister-in-law. Ex-sister-in-law. What did I say? Yeah, you, you said she was married to the account oh. holder. She was married to the brother of the account married holder? Married to his brother. I'm sorry. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Um, it was family, in other words. It was family, or ex-family. But, but family that was employed by UBS, so UBS has responsibility, you're saying, for her. I think so. I mean, she was the manager of the account for, uh, for all those years, and when this popped up, uh, I think the record reflects, you can see it if you read my amended uh, counterclaim as to, the, as to the, uh, the terrible things that she said. Whether it was in today's environment or yesterday's environment, it was not appropriate for a UBS employee to take that position. Well, we've already talked a little bit, but I, I will say one other thing in, in conclusion. My, by the way, I, I want to applaud my, uh, my brother. He and I have had a great relationship over the past four or five years, and I hope it's going to end at some point. Um, <laughs> and my client hopes it's going to end at some point. Um, but in his brief, he mentioned that it would be unwise for this court to rule against UBS. And in the amicus brief by SIFMA, the five lawyers argued that, and I want to read it, actually, financial services industry is not well equipped to honor <coughs> fiduciary duties to account beneficiaries. Well, I got to tell you, that really knocked me for a loop. If with all their money and all their lawyers and all their resources, they are not well equipped to handle a dispute or fiduciary duties, then who is? I mean, they seem to be well equipped to handle this case. And they made a decision, by the way, on the two smaller cases. They were well equipped, apparently, enough to make a decision and send out the money, even though it was in dispute, and even though the forms the, were, were rejected by them, yet in the bigger account, they apparently were not well equipped to handle the dispute, and here we are. Well, I think Thank that, you. that perhaps the point would be that, that um, sometimes uh, customer intentions are not particularly clear, 
and there are uh, disputes among beneficiaries, and that therefore um, really imposing a fiduciary duty on the uh, beneficiary uh, might not make sense, and it's better to, to uh, have uh, those disputes resolved by a court. Well, sometimes, of course. I mean, we live in a, in a world of, of court uh, res resolution, um, but not always. I mean, let me ask a, a silly question. Of, of the thousands and millions of IRAs out there, these custodial IRAs where you name a spouse or you name a child or something like that under the normal course of events, how many of those things are really disputed? Some are, we all agree, but if there's one or two percent of disputes out there, don't we think that the financial services industry, the Wells Fargo's and the Fidelities and the UBS's can handle them? To say that they're not well equipped, I just don't buy it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wells, you apparently come well recommended by your brother. Absolutely. <laughs> That's good to hear. And uh, the same with my brother, Mr. Frateroli. We've had a good working relationship over the past four or five years, and hopefully it won't go on for four or five more. <clears throat> uh, good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. I am John Wells on behalf of the Appellee UBS Financial Services. Um, I, I want to start uh, just by sort of level setting where we are in this action and, and why we're here, which is this case was decided at the superior court level uh, at the pleading stage on a motion for judgment on the pleadings. And as this court is well aware, the standard uh, on a Rule 12 motion is whether the allegations are sufficient as a matter of law to state a cause of action that is not merely consistent with, uh, but, but uh, plausible, plausibly suggests an entitlement to relief. And on what grounds was uh, the, uh, the, uh, your motion granted? It was grounded on the motion that Ms. Aliberti at the trial court did not plausibly plead causes of action for breach of fiduciary duty and violation of Chapter 93A. What about breach of contract? Same. The, the trial court granted the motion in its entirety. Okay. On, on all four claims. And the appeals court didn't agree with her. The appeals court didn't agree with her with respect to three out of the four. The intentional infliction of emotional distress claim it is gone. Agree. Everyone yeah. is that one but you agree that uh, the contract claim survived and the fiduciary duty claim survived and the um, 93A claim? 93A. That's correct, Your Honor. I do agree. And we, then we are on, not appealing. Before us, on, you're only challenging two, and that's, that's contract. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. I, I, at this point, we did not believe that she had sufficiently pled a breach of contract claim. The Superior Court agreed. The Court of Appeals disagreed. We're willing to pass on that. We'll argue it in the Superior Court, as Mr. Ferrara really said. We'll go back to the Superior Court on that claim. At issue here is the Superior Court agreed with us and granted the motion for judgment on, ple on the pleadings on the breach of fiduciary duty and Chapter 93A claims. And we believe that that was correctly decided because, as I'll discuss, Ms. Aliberti did not uh, plead allegations that, as a matter of law, could plausibly state uh, a claim for relief. What do you think of the Attorney General's letter? Uh, the Attorney General's letter, uh, I disagree uh, to the extent that they suggest that this is necessarily in trade or commerce. Uh, our position is that not everything that an entity like UBS does, which admittedly UBS acts in trade or commerce for the most part, <coughs> uh, I don't necessarily agree with the suggestion that it or any other similarly situated entity is always acting in trade or commerce. I think there are things that it can do uh, that are not trader commerce, and in this particular instance, it wasn't advertising, it wasn't selling, there was no product or service involved, it wasn't engaging with uh, a member of the public in the marketplace for purposes of a commercial transaction, it was merely carrying out the contractual wishes of its customer in making distributions to his named beneficiaries. And there is no, there's no case specifically on point where the custodian of an IRA account has been held in Massachusetts to have violated Chapter 93A uh, for doing so, or, or even implicating Chapter 93A. W and my disagreement with the, with the Attorney General's office would merely be that I think that there are cases which suggest that uh, a person or entity which otherwise acts in trade or commerce, in, in the particular case I'm thinking of, the Tetro uh, attorney case where an attorney acted in trade or commerce, Ayers brought a claim against an attorney who had prepared an estate plan, and th this court ultimately held that there must be a business context, and with respect to the heirs, there was no trade or commerce. A uh, little bit different situation with an attorney, but I would suggest that 
Uh, that is sort of the guidepost here because UBS was not necessarily doing something in the normal course of trade or commerce. But isn't, but that, isn't that their business, though? Isn't it, that it, is part their of their business. it is their business. But I don't think that, uh, Justice Butt, I don't think that that is something that, that you necessarily uh, need to decide the case on. Or, and while I disagree with the Attorney General's office, I don't, don't think it's Don't we have to give her some deference, though? Absolutely. It, it, which is why that I'm suggesting that I don't believe that you need to decide the case on those grounds on Chapter 93A. Because even if you do determine that this is trade or commerce, what I would suggest to you is that uh, she also fails on the second prong of a Chapter 93A case, which is she must plead allegations that are plausible on their face uh, that UBS acted uh, in an unfair or deceptive manner uh, with respect to her. And I don't believe that the allegations in the complaint or her counterclaim rise to that level. Uh, as it was discussed with Mr. Frateroli, her allegations are that UBS was rude to her, treated her unprofessionally, discourteous is the word I well, I think it's I think it's also that as to the larger account, uh, not only were they not responsive, but for for no reason they they held onto that uh, account for a, for a, a lengthy period of time. That, that that's the gravamen, I, th I think. That, that's that's the allegation. Uh, I would suggest that the court must view the pleadings in context, which are undisputed, which is as we've discussed. Mr. Kinney died, leaving instructions that because he died unexpectedly and was in the process of changing his beneficiary designations, that were somewhat unclear and ultimately became contested. And so UBS went through the process of trying to determine whether or not it could make payments. And there were th remember, there were three different accounts, different circumstances with regard to each of the three accounts. Ultimately, uh, ultimately, we were the ones that filed a declaratory judgment action in the Superior Court to have the court decide. Who is the rightful owner of these funds? Who but can as it related to the third account, there was no paperwork at all. There was no paperwork. That is correct. The, the only issue with regard to the third account was Mr. Gillespie, who had been named as a beneficiary recently on the two smaller accounts, popped up literally three weeks after Mr. Kinney passed away through counsel with a strongly worded letter stating, uh, I represent Mr. Kinney. We're reserving our rights under Massachusetts law. We intend to bring a claim. Do not make distribution of the funds. And, and this is not uncommon. As the SIFMA amicus brief indicated, there are beneficiary disputes. What right could he possibly have had to her account? To ultimately, ultimately, he didn't have any. But because he we asserted were a right. to distribute other, other funds, uh, not hers, though. I'm sorry? We were willing to distribute two other funds, but not hers. So, and you didn't communicate accounts. what you were doing to her. Well, sep separate, separate accounts. So the, the first, the two smaller accounts, he left identical instructions with regard to each of the smaller accounts. The context for this is that the client agreement with the customer says, you may change your beneficiary designations at any time in a matter acceptable to UBS. Ultimately, UBS determined <coughs> four or five months after he passed away, uh, after legal review, uh, that his and his instructions were clear. In other words, he wrote down on his form four names with 25% next to each other. Now, I think we would all agree if he wrote it on the back of a napkin, four names and 25%, that's reasonably clear. The only issue was because he did it on a boilerplate form with instructions that he apparently ignored or, or didn't read. Uh, and then it became an issue, but ultimately UBS determined that his instructions were clear. And distributions were made, including to Ms. Alaberti at the time, who did not make any objection to receiving one quarter of the funds in those two accounts, or her son, who also was named as a beneficiary, didn't object to that. It was only uh, sometime later uh, that she began requesting documents and asking for more information. And as time passed, uh, UBS had advised both Ms. Alaberti through her counsel and uh, Mr. Gillespie through his counsel, look, this is a disputed account. There's not anything you can, UBS can do other than have an order of the court. Please get us an order of the court. I know, but I think what's going on, assuming that you agree with the, uh, or assuming we agree with the Attorney General as it relates to 93A and the uh, analogy to Rafferty versus uh, Merck, um, the issue is, as to that third account, where there is no um, uh, paperwork uh, submitted at all uh, by the decedent, um, was it uh, a unfair and deceptive act of practice as pled um, uh, to retain that money and not communicate adequately with the beneficiary for the period of time in question? I would answer that question, no, absolutely not. And, and first of all, I'd like to clarify that although there are some allegations in the counterclaim that there was a lack of communication, I think Mr. Frateroli would agree with me that after several months, 
when I became engaged in the case, and UBS actually retained outside counsel, he and I were in contact for, for quite a bit of time, well before he sent his 93A demand letter. We had disagreements about what UBS could do with the money. Ultimately, we made the decision, we're going to interplead the funds and, and let the court decide. Was the family member who was the account manager ever removed? Yes. When? Yeah, early, within, within days. Within days of, of Ms. Alaberti's complaint that she had been discourteous in the text messages. She was removed almost immediately, okay. which, is, which could be part of the problem <coughs> why UBS was somewhat uncommunicative, is the principal relationship partner on the account had been removed at Ms. Alaberti's request. I'm not excusing good reason. that. Yeah, good for good reason. reason, absolutely. Yeah, no doubt about that. But to, to Justice Lowy's point, I would argue that even if those allegations pled a cause of action, that cause of action is breach of contract, not Chapter 93A. Because as Chief Justice Gantz was alluding to earlier, her claim sounds in contract. This is a contract claim. And putting aside the breach of fiduciary duty claim, which, which I'm happy to talk about, but I think that there's absolutely no basis uh, for the assertion of a fiduciary duty here, clearly no case law to support that, particularly at the time this complaint was pled. And the question, again, is whether it was plausible on its face. But ultimately, this is a breach of contract case. She has a contractual remedy. If UBS did something, if they waited too long to make payment, if they didn't communicate with her, if they treated her poorly, whatever the allegations may be, we'll go to the Superior Court and we'll argue about that, and the judge will be able to determine whether or not UBS breached its contractual obligations. He could also but amend I, his complaint. I uh, suppose so. I suppose he could at this point. It, it's, it's been quite a while. But, but the other point I would like to make is, I think the case law is clear, that putting aside the fiduciary duty claim, this court has held plenty of times that the mere breach of contract is not sufficient to support a Chapter 93A claim. So but, I think but, that's one but, of the but, other but, reasons why Chapter But the court has also that. held many times <coughs> that a breach of the covenant of good faith and fair dealing does rise to the level of 93A. Sure. So if there is a breach of, if there is a contractual relationship between the bank and the account holder, Mr. Kenny, and as a result of Mr. Kenny's beneficiary designation, a third party contractual, a third party beneficiary contractual relationship with Ms. Alberti, and if it were to be found to be a breach of the covenant of good faith and fair dealing, why would that not be sufficient to make it a 93A? Uh, I would suggest that it doesn't rise to the level of such a breach in this particular instance. I believe that the allegations on their face don't support the necessary level of unfair conduct, which... Okay, I, mean, I, I get that, but why would it not be in trade or commerce if there's clearly a trade and commerce relationship between Mr. Kenny and the bank? Undisputably, there's a trade or commerce element between Mr. Kenny and the bank. My only assertion, and I understand that the Attorney General's office disagrees, is that there's no... The courts in the state have never held that a, a, an IRA account custodian acting in the capacity that UBS was here uh, is acting in trade or commerce or is violating Chapter 93A <coughs> in being, determining, processing, maintaining the, the beneficiary distribution process after an account owner dies. Um, to some extent, I think this re case requires the, the court to step into the breach where there is no existing law. But as I suggested earlier, I don't believe the court has to do that. I don't think the trade or commerce issue, particularly in light of the Attorney General's office letter, is necessarily dispositive because there are separate elements of the Chapter 93A. Right. So, I mean, I, I understand your argument that it does not rise to the level. Put that aside for a moment. Let's let's assume we have a different case. Uh, we have a not a good bank like UBS. We have a bad bank, which decides for whatever reason that it can make some money holding on to an IRA by delaying payment to the beneficiary for a substantial period of time, and does so intentionally with the view of accruing <clears throat> the whatever the benefits come from holding that money, be able to invest that money. Uh, would that not rise to the level of a 93A? Well, I, I think that e Chapter 93A, each case has to be judged on its own merits based on the allegations in each case. And I would grant that, aside from this case, there certainly could be instances in which a, a claimant may plead allegations that would rise to the level of a 93A breach. So the, issue, that so, that hasn't been done in this so the issue was not really trade and commerce, trade or commerce. The issue really is whether or not the conduct of UBS rises to the level of what I would characterize the, the bad bank as opposed to the good bank trying to simply sort out a complicated situation. That's correct. And I would even phrase it <clears throat> a little bit differently in that has she sufficiently pled allegations that rise to that level in this context where admittedly 
what I would submit is that UBS was acting uh, at all times with reasonable business judgment. And we can all disagree whether or not it took them too long to make payments, whether it should have uh, been re more responsive to her letters. And I would submit that one of the, one of the letters, the form letters that Mr. Frateroli referred to, back to Ms. Alaberti says, you know, following up on our telephone conversation on February 24th, 2014. So there was communication. I guess the question might be, I mean, how long is it reasonable before you uh, interplead? That's a fair question, uh, Justice Lowy, and I would submit, uh, going back to the fiduciary duty question, if there was ever any suggestion in a situation like this that UBS had a, some fiduciary or higher level duty to a customer other than a contractual duty, uh, then you can be certain that the payment would have made, been made a whole lot quicker. Um, for the fiduciary duty claim, I would still submit that that theoretically could be a breach of fiduciary duty because anything that UBS does, it's contrary to the, um, the, the, the best interests of one individual over others could expose the firm to a, a fiduciary duty claim. But to that point, it, it's hard to say what's reasonable because again, every case is different. Some take longer, some take shorter. In this case, it, it possibly could have taken shorter. Um, ultimately, I was the individual that made the decision to file the interpleader claim after lengthy discussions over a period of time with Mr. Alaberti and with uh, uh, Mr. Gillespie's attorney saying that we needed to get a court order. Neither of them were taking any action, and I'm not suggesting that, that you know, it was their fault for not doing so, but we had asked them to do that, and no one ever did. So finally, I just told the client, I said, we've, we can't keep holding this money, and we've got to do it. Does that rise to the level of 93A? I don't believe so. We were making the best business judgment we could at the time based on the facts as we knew them, uh, knowing that Mr. Gillespie had asserted a, a claim to this account through counsel that wasn't pursuing it. Um, you know, we were trying to be reasonable in, in all respects, and, and uh, there was never any intention to not follow up with Ms. Alaberti, who I'll note, um, importantly, um, she's claimed that she had legal right to information uh, it's important to note that she was not the account holder or the account holder's estate or personal representative. She was an individual who the account holder had written her name on a piece of paper, as with four other individuals. Uh, so I don't believe that she had any special rights to information on a confidential information on an account owner's account just by sending a letter saying, I disagree with his beneficiary designation, send me information. But there was one, there was no question that it was a, what, what was the question about uh, the, the large account? What was the question? The question was whether Mr. Gillespie was the intended beneficiary. How, My, and, and in what basis I was there for that claim? Uh, you, Your Honor, that was before I got involved in the case and it never went anywhere. But my understanding of it was, Mr. Gillespie was a friend of Mr. Kenny. And prior to his death, Mr. Kinney had decided that he wanted to, rather than leaving all of his money to Ms. Alaberti, which he had initially designated, he wanted to leave it to a number of individuals, including a niece of his who had just given birth. And when he filled out the forms, he didn't tell anybody specifically what he was going to do, but he did mention to his financial advisor, his former sister-in-law, that he wanted to leave some money to his niece, which he ultimately did. When he filled out the forms and returned them, they listed Craig Gillespie as the first person on the list designated as friend on two of those accounts. No paperwork for the third account, but our understanding is that Mr. Gillespie was going to attempt to make a case that Mr. Kenny, at the time of his death, was in the process of amending his beneficiary designations on this large account to make Mr. Gillespie the beneficiary, whether why, why in whole or in part. Any, why would that hold any water? I don't understand it. I don't understand why that was uh, something that would uh, delay the uh, payment. I don't understand that. Well. Garbage uh, claim. I, I, ultimately, I, I would suggest that it, it probably was. It, be, it held uh, up the process. Thought about it a lot. Do you the, need to think the, about it a long time? Yeah, the, the problem, Your Honor, is because UBS and, and other similarly situated institutions that deal with this, the Vanguards, Fidelities, Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, they deal with this all the time. They get thousands of these disputes all across the country. And so it will be easy to say in an isolated incident in, instance that... <coughs> his claim doesn't have merit. But when you're doing this as an institution and you're making institutional <coughs> decisions, once someone else makes a contrary claim to funds in an account, then the account becomes a, quote, disputed <coughs> account. And the institutions ultimately freeze the account so no distributions can be made, so it could never be subject to a claim that you just distributed funds that I was entitled to. I go to court on these disputes all the time. 
in the superior courts, divorce actions, matrimonial family actions where people are fighting over assets in an account. And are the disputes always meritorious? Not necessarily, but it puts the custodians in a very difficult position when you've got two people making completing, competing claims to the same funds, and their position is, we have to have a court order. We can't make a decision on this because we're going to be subject to somebody's wrath uh, either way. And in this case, it happened to be Ms. Aliberti. I would submit that if they had paid the money to Mr. Gillespie in the first instance, then uh, it probably would have been, I'm sorry, if, they, if it had paid the money to Ms. Aliberti, then Mr. Gillespie had a potential claim, uh, whether meritorious or not, but, but certainly subject to a claim. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you, Your Honors.